indeed, this worldly life's no more than a pastime and pleasure's vain. The final home, that's life for sure, with their knowledge this much attain. مالك يوم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم غير المغضوب عليه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة The first of our last salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. was born on the 5th of Sha'ban in the 38th year after Hijrah and died on the 25th of Muharram in the 95th year after Hijrah. He is revered by many as one of the greatest leaders in Islamic history and in virtually every school in the religion of Islam is revered as the exemplar when it comes to piety, worship, spirituality and humility. For Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn is seen as a colossus when it comes to spirituality. Today every school in the religion of Islam takes their spiritual knowledge from Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn. And what you find is that unfortunately his life has not been studied in the way it should be. Many schools within the religion of Islam have limited Ali ibn al Hussein to studying or to talking about the emotional aspects of his character. In the idea that when we normally mention Ali ibn al Hussein, we normally mention him in the context of Karbala and the tragedy of the 10th of Muharram. It is very rare for people to dissect Imam Ali ibn al Hussein outside of what happened at Karbala. Normally when you hear about his life, you hear of this man who was crying after Karbala, who was sad after Karbala. But there isn't really much of an analysis of Ali ibn al Hussein, the great spiritual reformer. Or Ali ibn al Hussein, the man who changed the direction of the religion of Islam when the religion was at its lowest ebb. And therefore tonight we'll seek to examine a personality who himself is seen as being a colossus, that even his great-grandfather, the Prophet, had mentioned his name even before he was born. As we stated, the Imam was born on the 5th of Sha'ban, 
And the 38th year after Hijrah, his father is of course Hussein ibn Ali. His mother is Shah Zanan, the daughter of the last of the kings of Persia. Shah Zanan, the name in English or the name in Arabic was referred to as Sayyidat al-Nisa. When Imam al Hussein had married her, his father Amir al Mu'mineen had of course known she had come originally from Persia. Jabir ibn Hurath had conquered Khurasan. And when he had conquered Khurasan, of the woman who converted to the religion of Islam from Khurasan was Shah Zanan. Shah Zanan, therefore, in that marriage, the narrations tell us that Imam Amir al Mu'mineen chose her to marry Imam al Hussein. And you find that this was the beginning of the mixing of the Arabs and the Persians. Before that, no such thing had really happened. The Arabs used to detest the Persians, and the Persians did not have time for any of the Arabs. And you found that this marriage of Imam al Hussein to Shah Zanan was a marriage which began a cross cultural link. It's as if Imam al Hussein was highlighting that there is no problem in the religion of Islam marrying a woman from a different culture. Today, you find many Muslims find it a sticking point explaining to their parents when they want to marry someone of a different culture. Whereas their Imams, the leaders of this religion, over four or five of them married women from a different culture. When Imam al Hussein married Shah Zanan, Imam al Hussein could have easily married someone from Medina, someone from his background. But it's as if he was enacting the verse of the Quran which says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Ya ayyuhan nas, Inna khalaqnakum min dakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. Oh mankind, we've created you from male and female and from different races and different tribes in order that you get to know one another. The best amongst you in the eyes of God is the one who is conscious of God's presence in their life. Notice the Quran didn't say we created you so that you become enemies of one another. No. The Quran says we created you so that you get to know one another. Imam al Hussein could have easily married someone from his city, someone from his village. Today in our communities, you have people who point out if the girl is not from our village, don't marry her. Or if the girl is not from our city, do not marry her. Or if you're lucky, if the girl is not from our country, do not marry her. Whereas Imam al Hussein married this Persian woman and she became the mother of an Imam. Even I remember this began the marriages of Arabs to Persians. This Imam al Hussein's marriage to Shah Zanan was the beginning of the marriage or the beginning of the movement of the Arabs marrying the Persians. I remember Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the Umayyad Khalifa, himself married a Persian woman. And even Abdul Malik ibn Marwan had his sons. One day he went to propose to Aqil al Murri. Aqil al Murri had daughters. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan went to Aqil al Murri's house and he said to him, I'd like for one of my sons to marry one of your daughters. Aqil al Murri replied with the most racist Arabic statement you can reply. Aqil was an Arab. He looked at Abdul Malik and he said, Spare me the Hujana. Abdul Malik looked at him and said, What do you mean Hujana? He said, Your sons are half Persians. My daughters only marry full Arabs. Look at that. You find that that racist tendency was still there. Imam al Hussein, what did he notice? Imam al Hussein noticed if I marry a Persian, first I am showing there is no difference but taqwa in the eyes of God. Secondly, it will allow for a cross culture where not only family cross culture, but also literature can cross culture as well. You found that many of the later Umayyad or Abbasids, they started marrying Persians as well. 
or they started employing Persians because of this marriage. For example, if you look at Bani, uh, Bani Umayyah, the last Bani Umayyah Khalifa Marwan, his mother was a Kurdi, half Kurdish, half Persian. Bani Abbas, the treasurers and the secretaries of Bani Abbas, you find Abu Salam al Khalal was Persian, Yaqub ibn Dawood was Persian, Al Muriani was Persian, the Barmaki family were Persians, Al Sahel were Persians. You find in the world of literature, Arabs started to read Persian literature. Persians used to start to read Arab literature. For example, Sibawai's teacher Khalil bin Ahmed. For example, Ahmed bin Yahya al-Baladhari translated Kisra's words of wisdom. And so on and so forth. In other words, Imam, Zayn, Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, his mother was Persian. And his father was an Arab. And it would be the first marriage of Ahl al-Bayt where an Imam of Al-Muhammad would marry someone from outside of the Arabs. The sad news was for Imam Zain al-Abideen was that his mother died a few days after giving birth to him. His mother died while she was in the state of Nifas. You know the state which a woman is in after she has given birth. You find that his mother died a few days only after she gave birth to him. And therefore, the only man who brought him up in his life was his father, Aba Abdullah. Otherwise, Imam Zain al Abidin, after a few days of his mother giving birth, his mother passed away and therefore he was an orphan. That didn't mean there wasn't a mother in his life. No, of course, the other wife of his father was a mother figure to him, and his wet nurse was a mother figure to him. And the manners he had with the ladies who replaced his mom, you would think that they were his mothers as well. In which way? For example, one of the most famous stories about Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein was that when he would sit on the dinner table with his stepmother, he would be sitting down and his stepmother would be sitting down. And he'd stay looking at the food and he'd then look at his stepmother. She'd look at him and she'd say to him, what's wrong? Why are you looking at me? He would say, I'm scared to put out my hand towards some food which you had your eyes on. At home sometimes when we eat with our mothers, we don't even wait for them to come from the kitchen. Eat, finish. Before you know it, the iftar is done, you've gone to watch television, your mother hasn't even started eating. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, even though his mother Shaharbanu, someone asks, why was her name changed? Because Imam al Hussein said, Shah, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen said, Shah Zanan means Sayyidat al Nisa. Sayyidat al Nisa is only Bibi Fatima. So her name was Shaharbanu, she passed away. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, even with his stepmother, he wanted to look. Is she looking at an area of food? I will not put my hand there until she takes. The moment she takes, then I will take after that. And that's why his father father loved him so much. Imam al Hussein loved Imam Zain al Abidin so much. He was not only his second eldest son, but on top of that, to Imam al Hussein, he saw the light of revelation in the face of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein. In which way? He, Imam al Hussein, narrates I once saw Ali ibn al Hussein when he was younger, he was ill. I said to him, My son, do you want me to get you a doctor? Someone to come and treat you? He said, Dad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after me, I am sure. Then Imam al Hussein said, I said to him, you remind me of Prophet Ibrahim. That when Prophet Ibrahim was in the fire and the angel Jibrail said, do you want any help? Prophet Ibrahim said, only my Lord will help me. Likewise, you have the same mannerisms of Prophet Ibrahim. Imagine when you have an attachment to your father like this, how then do you feel on the day your father needs you the most, you cannot be there for him? Because how old was he at Karbala? He was 22 years of age. 22. And we all know very well that you want to be by your father's side at every moment in his life, isn't it? Your father is the attachment in your life. He is your life. He is what you look up to. He is your source of pride and warmth and comfort. Those of you who've been to your father's janazah when he passes away, don't you just wish that he would come back in your life? But sometimes the only sense of solace is that you looked after your father, that you treated him well until the day he died. That when your father needed you, you were there for him. Only Allah knows 
how Ali ibn al Hussein recovered after the 10th of Muharram. Why? Some people say, when did he become ill? He didn't become ill on the 10th of Muharram. He became ill on the journey towards Karbala. On the journey towards Karbala, he picked up an illness which he could not recover from. When he got to the 10th of Muharram, he noticed that his father was now on his final legs. His elder brother Ali al Akbar had died. And you find that the six month old baby, his brother Abdullah, had died. And you find that his cousin Qasim had passed away. And all of the companions had passed away. The narrations tell us on the 10th of Muharram, just before Imam al Hussein was about to leave, Imam Zain al Abideen woke up from his state of a lack of consciousness. He woke up and he said, Oh people, get me a sword and get me a stick. They looked at him, they said, why? He said, because I want a stick so I can stand up and a sword so I can defend my father in his final moments. His father turned around to him. Now you can imagine Imam al Hussein to Imam Zain al Abidin is everything. Because Imam Zain al Abidin's mother died shortly after he was born. His father was everything to him. The narration say to us what? The narration say to us that his father said to him, Oh Zain al Abidin, you are God's proof on his creatures after I die. You must remain patient in this period. And what happened was, the next moment he came to see his father's body, he didn't. He only saw a horse return without his father on top of the horse. And that's why, do you know when Imam Zain al Abidin saw his father's body? When he came back to wash the body of his father. Many people ask, who performed the ghusl of Imam al Hussein? It was Imam Zain al Abidin. When? Three nights after the 10th of Muharram. Imam Zain al Abidin returned to Karbala. When he returned to Karbala, the narration say to us, Bani Asad, their wives were embarrassed by their husbands because their husbands did not help Imam al Hussein at Karbala. So Bani Asad's wives told their husbands that if you're not going to be alongside the grandson's prophet, the prophet's grandson, then what? Then at least go and bury the body of the grandson of the prophet. Bani Asad, their men went to Karbala after the 10th of Muharram. They wanted to bury the bodies of Imam al Hussein and his companions. But there was a problem. How do you know which body belongs to which head? The heads have gone and all you see are bodies. You don't know who to bury where. Then they said from the distance we saw Ali ibn al Hussein. At the time they didn't recognize him. They said we saw a man wearing black. He came towards us. We looked at him. He said to us, what are you doing here? We said, oh, we've just come to look at the place. He said, no, tell me honestly, what are you doing here? They said, we have come to bury the body of Abba Abdullah. So he said to them, please listen to these words. These are vital for those who do ziyara at Karbala. Because many people go to Karbala and are confused where, what they are doing and where they are going. When Imam Zayn al-Abideen said to them, they said, what shall we do? He said, go and bury or go and dig three different graves. They went to dig the first grave, the second grave, the third grave. They came back to him and they said to him, what shall we do? He said, the first grave is for the companions of my father. Bury them all in one grave. The second grave is for the family members. The third grave is for Habib ibn Mabahir. My father said he should have a grave for himself. Then after that, they said to him, he said to them, I am now going to bury a body which only I and those who are with me can bury. They said to him, whose body? He said, I'm going to bury my father. He had not seen the state of his father's body because they had taken them away from Karbala. He started to walk towards the body of Abba Abdullah. When he got near the body of Imam al Hussein, he noticed there were fingers on the ground. When he saw the fingers, what were they? Imam al Hussein had a ring on his finger. Someone chopped his finger to take his ring. Then when he got near his father's body, 
He noticed normally when you come near your father's body, you want to kiss your father on his neck, isn't it? He came and he saw a body without a neck and a body which was covered by arrows. And he took out a prayer mat. And they asked him, Zain al Abidin, what are you doing? Why are you taking out the prayer mat? He said, so I can collect all the different pieces of my father's body. Then after that, what did he do? After that, the narration say to us, he said to them, I am going to the Furat. There is a body that lies there. When he went towards that body, he narrates, I lifted the right side, the left all fell on the ground. And when I lifted the left side, the right all fell on the ground. And he called out, Ya Qamar Bani Hashim Abu Fadl al Abbas. He ended up burying all the bodies. He went back towards Kufa and then towards Sham. And when they would ask him later, O oh, Ali ibn al Hussein, what was the most difficult part for you? Was it Karbala? Was it Kufa? Was it Sham? He would reply, Asham, Asham, Asham. And he would say, if you saw the way they treated us in Sham. He says, on the first day we entered Sham, Sahal bin Sa'ad al Sa'adi, a companion of Rasulullah, came to Ali ibn al Hussein. When he came to him, he saw him. He says, Sahal says, I saw everybody merrymaking. Everybody was joyous. Everybody was happy. I thought, is this day a day of Eid? So I asked someone, is this a day of Eid? They said, no. Do not be surprised if the heavens turn on us and the earth sucks us. Said, what is it? The reply was, these are the family of the prophets of God. And they have been killed and these are their prisoners. Sahal bin Sa'ad al Sa'adi narrates, I saw Ali ibn al Hussein with chains around his body. I came to him and I said to him, Oh Ali ibn al Hussein, I am Sahal bin Sa'ad al Sa'adi, the companion of your great grandfather Rasulullah. He looked at me and he said, Oh Sahal, I beg of you one thing. Please go and buy a piece of cloth for me. Sahal thought, if I go and buy a piece of cloth, it means Ali ibn al Hussein wants the cloth to cover his body. He says, I bought the piece of cloth to Ali ibn al Hussein, and I saw him put the piece of cloth between the chain and his neck. And he said to me, Oh Sahal, the chain has been cutting through my neck since Karbala. <laughs> Then after that, Imam Ali ibn Hussein narrates, Wallah, we were walking and a man came to me and said, Curse on you and curse on your people. He looked at him and he said, Oh man, do you know who we are? The man said, I don't, but I've been told you are a group of rebels. So curse on you. He said to him, Oh man, have you read the verse in the Quran? He said, yes, I have. He said, have you read the verse in the Quran? He said, yes, I have. He said, have you read the verse in the Quran? He said, yes, I have. He said, have you read the verse in the Quran? He said, yes, I have. He said, he said to him, yes, I have. He said, do you know who those verses refer to? He said, yes, they refer to Al Muhammad. He said, then who are we? He looked at him, he said, who are you? He said, I am from Al Muhammad. That was that's my father's head you see on the spear. He said, who? He said, Hussein ibn Ali. He said, they have killed Hussein ibn Ali. He said, yes. Imagine those people did not know who was killed. And that's why in the Bazaar of Sham, you've been to the Bazaar of Sham? In that Bazaar, do you know what the narration say? The narration say that when Imam Zain al Abidin was taken through the Bazaar, what is called Jami' al Amawi today, that area towards Jami' al Amawi, Sug al Hamidiyah, when Imam Zain al Abidin was taken, you know, you know what Bibi Zainab says? She says, there were people pouring boiling water on the head of my nephew. <laughs> And they were poking him with spears as he was walking through the bazaar. And then we arrived at Yazid's palace and Imam Zain al Abidin had to see Yazid flick the lips of Imam al Hussein with a stick. But I tell you, Imam Zain al Abidin, that khutbah he gave in Sham, that khutbah he was only 22. And it's a message to our 22 year olds. Have you ever given a lecture like your master Zain al Abidin? At the age of 22, he stood in front of Yazid and he gave a khutbah which shook Yazid's empire. 
when he said Allah has granted us six and given us excellence in seven. Allah has given us knowledge and Allah has given us patience, eloquence, generosity, forbearance and the believers love for us. And he's given us excellence in seven. From us is Rasul Allah, from us is Ali, from us is Hamza, from us is Ja'far, from us is Hassan, from us is Hussein, and from us is the Mahdi. Those of you who know me, know me. Those of you who don't, let me tell you who I am. I am the son of Mecca and Mina. I am the son of Zamzam and Safa. I am the son of the best of man to have held the black, ro the black stone in his robe and the best of them to have circumambulated the Kaaba. I am the son of the man who was taken by Burak through the air. I am the son of the man who led the angels in prayer. I am the son of the man who was taken to Sidrat al-Muntaha. I am the son of Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am the son of Ali al-Murtada, the one who fought the disbelievers until they said La ilaha illallah. I am the son of the man who fought with two swords and with two spears, who went on true migrations. I am the son of the believer's pious one, the descendant of the prophets, the annihilator of the polytheists, the commander of the faithful, the glory of the worshippers. Then he continued to say what? I am the son of the man who fought the disbelievers and exterminated their progenies. The man who was the best of them in prayer, the guardian of Allah's wisdom and his arrow targeting all the hypocrites. I am the son of the master of Iraq, the master of Iraq and the lion of Hijaz. I am the son of a Mecki and a Madani and a Badri and a Khifi and a Aqabi and a Muhajri and an Ansari. That's my grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he says, I am the son of the masters of the youth of paradise, Hassan and Hussein. Then he says, I am the son of Fatima al Zahra until he says, I am the son of the man who was slain on the earth of Karbala. When he said this, Yazid said, recite the Adhan, quickly recite the Adhan. Do not let him continue. When they recited the Adhan and the person called out Allahu Akbar, Imam Zain al Abidin called out in front of the people, truly, there is none as great as Allah. Then when he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, he said, my eyes and my hands and all my body testify that there is no Lord but Allah. Then when he said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Imam said, O oh Yazid, is Muhammad your grandfather or is he mine? If you say he's your grandfather, then you are a liar. But if you know he is mine, then why did you kill my father on the plains of Karbala? Because of this khutbah of Imam Zain al Abidin and the khutbah of Sayyidina Zainab, Yazid had to do what? He had to allow Imam Zain al Abidin and Sayyidina Zainab to leave. That's why from the day they left Karbala, Karbala until the 40th, on the 40th after Karbala, not one year in prison. It was exactly 40 days they returned back to Karbala. Someone will turn around and say, what do you mean not one year? I've heard it's one year for 40 years. Now you come and say it's not one year. Logically, historically, mathematically, all of them can be proved that it was 40 days. In terms, historically speaking, you find that it's very clear within the narrations. The journey of the Ahlul Bayt from Karbala to Kufa to Sham until after Sham, they return back to Karbala geographically. It is very clear that it took 40 days. Someone will even come forward and say, why? If Imam Zain al Abidin and Bibi Zainab gave a khutbah and Yazid after that khutbah kept them in prison for one year. So what was the point of the khutbah? What effect did the khutbah have? If Yazid listens to your khutbah and says, okay, good job, go in prison for one year. Their khutbah was so powerful, Yazid had to get rid of them. Because their khutbah shook Yazid's palace. On top of that, someone may turn around and say, yes, but how can you do that journey in 40 days? If Imam al Hussein left Mecca on the 9th of the Hijjah and arrived in Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram and it took Imam al Hussein from Saudi Arabia to Iraq 22 days. So what's wrong with the 40 day round journey? 9th of the Hijjah until 2nd of Muharram. So why can't you do Iraq, Sham, back to Iraq on the 40th? 
When they return back on the 40th, and there are numerous other proofs which I can give in another lecture, when they return back to Iraq on the 40th, Jabir bin Abdullah al Ansari was the first visitor to the shrine of Imam al Hussein, to the grave of Imam al Hussein. Jabir came with Atiyah al Awfi to the grave of Imam al Hussein. Jabir was blind at the time and he asked Atiyah, Atiyah, what do you see? Atiyah said, I see from far away. Some people are coming. Jabir said, if it is Ibn Ziyad, then tell me. If it's Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, also tell me. At this moment, Atiyah said it's Ali ibn al Hussein. When Jabir was taken to Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Jabir wanted to tell Imam Ali ibn al Hussein what happened at Karbala. Imam preceded him by saying, Oh Jabir, you do not know what they did to us in Karbala. Nor at Kufa, nor at Sham, nor back at Karbala. Until Imam Zain al Abidin returned to Medina. The question now Imam Zain al Abidin lived for 35 five years after Karbala. What did Imam Zain al Abidin do in those 35 years after Karbala to reform the society he was living in? Why? Because Imam Zain al Abidin recognized that the people who were at the helm of the Islamic Empire were the same people who killed his father in their salah. They would say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulallah. Yet after their salah, they go and kill the grandson of Rasulallah. Imam Zain al Abidin therefore began a reform system of the whole Islamic Empire where in 35 years he gave Islam life after it was in a state of death. Islam was dead. When Yazid was in power, Islam was dead. Imam Zain al Abidin, through his actions in his life, through his steps in his life, gave Islam life back again. In which way? After Karbala, Imam Zain al-Abidin was wondering, how do I bring these people alive again? Especially after they had killed Imam al Hussein, he wondered, what's the best way to reform the society? The first thing he did, he kept on purchasing more servants in his house and teaching them the origin of the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. In which way? He would bring these servants because he knew that the Arabs, their mind is so enclosed, if you bring a hammer, it will not open the mind. So the best option, what is it? Let me bring servants into the house. I'll culture them with the teachings of my grandfather. And slowly you will see a change. And I tell you, by the end of his life, his servants were more religious than most of the Muslims who were born Muslim. Have you noticed how a convert is sometimes more religious than those who are born in the religion? Imam Zayn al Abidin brings these servants. And he teaches them the manners and the principles of Ahl al-Bayt in his house. I remember reading once, Imam Zain al-Abidin called for one of his servants to come. Once he called, there was no reply. A second time, there was no reply. A third time, there was no reply. On the fourth time, the servant came. Imam said, I called you three times. Did you not hear me? The servant said, no, I heard you very well. He said, so why didn't you reply? said, I want to taste the flavor of the mercy of Ali ibn al Hussein. said, what do you mean? said, all the other masters we had, if we don't come to their first call, they hit us. Yet Ali ibn al Hussein calls you three times and you don't come. But on the fourth time when you come, he looks at you with humility. Not a master-slave relationship, but the relationship of a friend with a friend. On another occasion, one of his servants is pouring soup. The whole of the soup falls on the robe of Imam Zain al Abidin. Some of us, if our servant makes a mistake in our house, we are the rudest people to our servant. Aren't we? Whereas Imam Zain al Abidin tells us what? That is a fellow human. He is not your trust. It's the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that servant poured the hot water, the whole of the hot water. Imagine a servant pours hot water on your robe. Some of us may swear. Some of us may tell our father sack them. Some of us may say never bring this person into our house again. Imam knew these people aren't as privileged as we are. So treat them with humility. The servant looked in the face of Imam Zain al-Abideen and look what the servant said. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ 
What did the servant say? The servant looked at Imam Zain al-Abidin and said, Those who restrain their anger. Imam said, I've restrained my anger. Imam said, I have forgiven. Allah loves the righteous. Imam said, you are free for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know what's beautiful about this? Not the Imam's behavior. That a servant knows as much Quran as the Imam. <laughs> have you ever asked yourself, have you discussed Ahlul Bayt with your servants at home? You ever asked yourself or no? Or are they just doing work? Imam Zain al Abidin, that person, he'd bring him closer to Ahlul Bayt. And that's why Sa'id ibn Musayyib narrates a phenomenal story. Sa'id ibn Musayyib says, We were with Zain al Abidin one day. The area we were in suffered a drought. There was no rain coming down at all. Imam Zain al Abidin said to all of us, Everyone get together in dua. Raise your hands, all of you together, and Allah will send rain down. Sa'id says, all of Zain al Abidin's servants and his friend's servants came. And he said, I looked at all of them reciting dua with tears coming down. But there was still no rain coming. Then some of them left, except one servant of Zain al Abidin, a black servant. He said, I looked at him from far away. Everyone had stopped reciting dua except this black servant. As soon as the black servant began reciting dua, after a few minutes, the rain started pouring down on us. He says, I went to Zain al Abidin later. I said, Imam, do you mind if I purchase one of the servants from you? Imam said, Why purchase? I'll give him to you. Sa'id says, I told the Imam, there's a specific one. The Imam said, which one? <coughs> Have a look at the ones who are in my house. They are not my servants. They are like my students. Choose. He looked at them. He said, he's not here. Imam said, there's only one more of them and he's outside. Sa'id said, I went outside. I saw him in front of me. I said, Imam, that's the one. Imam said, why? He said, Imam, that's the one who when he recited dua, the rain all came down. Imam said, there, take him. When that servant was leaving, he turned to Imam Zain al Abidin and said to him, Why is it that he wants me to go with him? He said, Because he saw your dua and he wants you to be alongside him because he knew you're a man of piety. This servant left Imam Zain al Abidin. Sa'id ibn Musayyib says, I saw him walking and I saw him stop at a place and I saw him say, Ya Allah. Now that my secret between me and you has been divulged, I prefer you take my life away now because I don't want to act insincere with the gift you've given me. Some of us, if we had that gift, would abuse it. That servant said, Ya Allah, now that someone knows about the gift you've given me, take my life. I don't want to live a life of arrogance. Those servants, Imam, do you know what he'd say to them? I want you to go out to every house in Medina and tell them about Ahlul Bayt. The servants would go out. They'd tell the people about Ahlul Bayt. They'd come back. Imam would say, how's things going? They say, not too well. Imam would say, why? Say, we're speaking with the elders, but they're not listening. Imam said, leave the elders, go to the youth. The elders will not listen. Go to the youth and tell them about Rasulullah. Tell them about Imam Amir al Tell them about Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. Their hearts are more willing to take him. Number one, the servants. Number two, the second way he reformed society, he wrote his magnificent book of supplications, as Sahif as Sajjadiyah. I tell you, there is no book of supplications like a Sahif as Sajjadiyah. Because the Imam would always say, Dua is the weapon of the believer. And it is the light of the heavens of the earth. Imam in another hadith, Imam Hassan, when they were asking him, what's the distance between heaven and earth? Imam would say, the distance between the skies and the earth is the cry of an oppressed person in Dua. As-Sahif as sajjadiyah is the greatest book of supplications written by a human being. Someone asks the question, why did he write a book on Dua? Because Dua 
is what opens up our relation with God. He felt that when the Arabs had killed his father, they had lost all relationship with God in their life. There was no more God in their life. Rather, they were thinking of a world of I, not a world of we. So he wrote a Sahifa Sajjadiyya, a dua for your mother, a dua for your father, a dua for someone who's ill, a dua for the companions of Rasulullah, a dua for jihad, a dua for absolutely every stage in your life, 51 duas. And you know what the shame is? There are lovers of Zain al Abidin who have never read one dua in a Sahifa Sajjadiyya. Isn't it embarrassing? Do you know, not this Pope, the one before him. I had a friend of mine who had visited the Vatican. He looked in the library of the Pope and he saw a Sahifa Sajjadiyya in the library. He asked him, what is the Sahifa Sajjadiyya in your library? He said, I do not see a book of Psalms of Dawood like this book of Psalms. And that's why in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we call a Sahifa Sajjadiyya the Psalms of Al-Muhammad, Zabur Al-Muhammad. Because the book of the Psalms in the Bible is a book of dua, isn't it? The book of dua, like the Zabur, in Ahlul Bayt is Sahiba Sajjadiyya. And in Sahiba Sajjadiyya, amongst the most beautiful duas, is, you'll find of the duas he's collected, dua Makarim al Akhlaq. Phenomenal dua. And in that dua, Makarim al Akhlaq, there are lines, three lines, which he talks about relations with the family members. He felt the people had lost their relations with family. They were willing to kill their own family member. In that book, do you know what he had written? There's a line, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa abdilni min bughdati ahli al-shan'an al-mahabba wa min uquq dhaw al-arham al-mabarra wa min khidlan al-aqrabin al-nusra. Do you know what Imam Zayn al-Abdin says? Ya Allah, change the hatred of my cousins into love for me and change their stubbornness into freedom with me and change their difficulties into ease. Imam Zayn al Abdi in those three lines in Dua Makarim al Akhlaq saw around him in society Salat al Rahim was being broken. Brothers don't talk to each other, sisters hate each other, in laws disrespect each other. So he wrote Dua Makarim al Akhlaq so that the Akhlaq, morals between people, returns. That's why even he himself had a cousin who fell in some debt. That cousin kept on saying, Where's Zayn al Abidin? Why doesn't he lend me some money? And Imam Zain al Abidin wouldn't come to him. That cousin began to abuse Imam Zain al Abidin day and night in front of the people. When Imam Zain al Abidin died, that cousin, that cousin, saw Imam al Baqir, Imam Zain al Abidin's son. He said to him, There used to be a man who used to wear a hood. And in the middle of the night, he would come and give me food. But I've not seen that man for a few nights. Who is it? Imam al-Baqir says, that was my father, the cousin you used to abuse. You used to abuse him in the morning, in the evening he brings you food. You see how Imam Zayn al abidin he was the embodiment of his du'as. When he would say something in his du'a, he would act it after reading the du'a. That was number two. Number three, he wrote Risalat al huquq the right of God, the right of yourself, the right of your mother, the right of your father, the right of your brother, the right of your sister, the right of your stomach, the right of your eyes, the right of your hands, the right of your private parts, the right of fasting, the right of prayer, the right of the non-Muslim, the right of the Mu'addin, the right of every single right you can imagine. Today we have United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, don't we? Tell me the Declaration of Human Rights, tell me about my right of God or the right of my soul or the right of my eye or the right of my hand or the right of my father or the right of my mother Imam Zain al Abidin 1400 years before the UN prepared the declaration of human rights wrote Risalat al Hukuk the treaties of rights of the human being and do you know what my favorite part of Risalat al Hukuk is the right of the father 
in Rasalat al Hukud, you know what Imam Zayl Abdin writes? He says, وَأَمَّا حَقُّ أَبِيكَ فَتَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ أَصْلُكَ وَأَنَّكَ فَرْعُهُ وَأَنَّكَ لَوْ لَا لَمْ تَكُنْ فَمَهْمَا رَأَيْتَ فِي نَفْسِكَ مِمَّا يُعْجِبُكَ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّ أَبَاكَ أَصْلَ النَّعْمَةِ عَلَيْكَ فِيهِ Know that the right of your father, and this is just one of 50 rights. Know that the right of your father is that he is your root and you are his branch. And were it not for him, you would never be. So whenever you see anything in yourself that impresses you, know that it's because of your father's blessings that you achieved it. Today, you have some youth, as soon as they achieve something, they forget their father. Imam says whenever you see anything that impresses you, know that your father is the root of that blessing. So he wrote Rasalat al Hukuk, that was number three. Then after that, he changed the society around him through his salah. That's why his, his three most famous names, the three most famous names of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, what are they? Number one, as Sajjad. The one who used to always be in sujood. And do you know what the irony is? When people used to come to him and say, your ibadah is so great, your worship is so great. He said, my worship is not half of my grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number one, as sajjad Number two, Zain al-Abideen. The adornment of the worshippers. This name was given to him by Rasulullah. Rasulullah had Imam al Hussein in his, in his lap. He looked at Jabir bin Abdullah al Ansari and said, Oh Jabir, this Hussein will have a son called Ali. On the day of judgment, there will be a call which will say, Where is Zain al Abideen? And his son Ali will come forward and say, Ana Zain al Abideen. Imagine that Allah will say that this is Zain al Abideen. Number three, the third name he had, which highlighted how disciplined he was in his worship, was what? Was Dhul Thafanat. Dhul Thafanat. Do you know what Thafanat are? In English, they are called calluses. You know the camel. Because it grazes its knee so much on the ground, some of the skin gets peeled off, isn't it? Some of the skin hangs out. Imam Zain al Abideen, from the amount of prostration he used to do, remember, he is the one who has the famous line if mankind knew how much reward they were getting in prostration, they would never lift their head from prostration. The Imam used to perform prostration so much that you know what used to happen to him? The skin would peel off his forehead. That skin which peels off his forehead, the narrations say to us that that skin, when it sticks out, used to look like the skin of a camel sticking out of its knee. So they called him Dhul Thafanat. Imam al Baqir used to say that my father twice a year would cut off the skin from his forehead because of the amount of sujood he did, the skin would be hanging out of his forehead. Someone asks, why did he focus on salah so much? If a person is disciplined in their prayer, they'll be disciplined everywhere else in their life. And so Imam focused on his salah and focused on those around him in salah. Through all of this, Imam Zain al Abideen, 35 years after Karbala, through the servants, through a Sahiba Sajjadiya, through a Salat al Hukuk, through a Salah, and through his companions. Never forget the great companions of Zain al Abideen. The first of them, Abu Hamza Thamali. You've read Dua Abu Hamza in, Ram in Shah Ramadan. And why should I not cry when you place me in the grave? And I see the darkness of the grave and the narrowness of the grave. And I see Munkar and Nakir coming towards me in the grave, asking me questions. That Abu Hamza Thamali, one of the greatest companions of Imam Zain al Abideen. Sa'id ibn Jubair killed by Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi because of the greatness of his prayer. Companion of Imam Zain al Abideen. Ambar died in the time of Imam Zain al Abideen. Kumail, Dua Kumail, was killed in the time of Imam Zain al Abideen. All of them were killed by Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi. Do you know how much they used to bully Imam Zain al Abideen? Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi and Hisham bin Ismail. 
And there is one story which to me highlights the final way he changed the society around him. His akhlaq was phenomenal. You know Hisham bin Ismail when he was governor of Medina, do you know what he used to do to Imam Zain al-Abideen? When Imam Zain al-Abideen leaves his house, Hisham bin Ismail asks children to come and pelt things at Imam Zain al-Abideen. And he barges Imam Zain al-Abideen when he's walking in the street. Hisham bin Ismail, his maternal uncle was Abd al-Malik. When Abd al-Malik bin Marwan was replaced by Walid, Walid put Umar bin Abdul Aziz as governor of Medina. Umar bin Abdul Aziz sacked Hisham. When he sacked him, he caught Hisham and he chained him to a wall. And when he chained him to the wall, he called out to the people, O oh people, whoever Hisham bin Ismail has been bad to, come and take your revenge from Hisham. Hisham bin Ismail used to be rude to Imam Zain al Abidin, isn't it? Imagine someone came to you and said, We've now caught the person who was rude to you every day you left your house. You leave your house, someone throws stones at you. Now that person is chained. They came to Imam Zain al Abidin, they said, Do you know who got caught today? His companion said to him, Who got caught? Imam said, Who? He said, Hisham bin Ismail. He's now chained. What shall we do to him now that he's chained? Imam said, what are you thinking of doing? They said, shouldn't we take revenge? Imam said, I'll tell you what we should do. Go up to him and say to him, Oh Hisham, if you are hungry, then Zain al Abidin will feed you. And if you are thirsty, then I will quench your thirst. And if you have a loan, I'll pay the loan for you. Would you do this to someone who's tortured you? But the way he inspired was through his morals. The morals came out. Others would attack the person. But the Imam, his morals would come out. And that morals emerged from a man who because of the amount of reflection he gave God, without a doubt his morals would come out like that. I was near the Kaaba and I saw a man holding on to the Kaaba crying and crying and crying. I thought, who is this man? Surely he has committed a lot of sin for him to cry that much. I got near him, it was Zain al Abideen. I looked at him and I was listening to his dua and I heard him say, Oh Allah, if you removed your rope from me, then whose rope do I hold on to? Oh Allah, you always increase my life, but what if I increase in sinning against you? He said, I saw Zain al Abidin. I thought if Zain al Abidin talks like this, then what do I say? He said, I said, Oh Imam, you cry, you. And we are the sinners. And he turned around to me and he said, Oh, Ta'awus, it doesn't matter if you are an Ethiopian slave or you are a son of Quraysh, all of you will be made answerable. All of us will be made answerable on the day of judgment. But look at those lines. Oh Allah, whose rope would I hold on to if you cut your rope from me? And Ya Allah, you increase my life, but I increase my disobedience. Someone asked, why do Ahlul Bayt talk like that? Is it because they are sinners? No, it is because they are teaching us. If we talk like this to Allah, then how will you talk to Allah? And that's why when Hisham bin Abdul Malik was sitting near the Kaaba, Hisham was sitting, he tried to get to Hajar al Aswad, he couldn't get there. Then what did he see? He saw a man walking towards Hajar al Aswad. When he saw the man walking to Hajar al Aswad, he saw the whole of Mecca open. The man went, kissed Hajar al Aswad, and came back. Hisham arrogantly turned to Faraz Daq. He said, Faraz Daq, who's that man? How did that thing open for him? Faraz Daq and his famous lines of poetry. He was imprisoned for these lines. They put him in prison. He said he is someone. His lines are impeccable brothers and sisters. He says he is someone whose footsteps are known by every place. And he is someone who is known by the house in Mecca. 
and the place that is visited by most frequently the sanctuary. He says that he is the son of the best of all of the men of God. A man who is upright and chaste, unstained and righteousness. He is Ali ibn al Hussein, whose grandfather is the Prophet and whose mother is Fatima. He who claims to recognize Allah, recognizes his primacy and his superiority above all men because nations came to this religion because of his family. When he goes towards the Kaaba, it's as if the Kaaba is grasping to hold him. When Hisham bin Abdul Malik heard this, he said, How dare you talk like this about anyone else? He imprisoned him. When Imam Zain al Abidin found out he was imprisoned, Imam Zain al Abidin, what did he say? Imam Zain al Abidin went and paid for him to be released. You know what Faraz Daq said? He said, Oh, Imam, you don't need to release me. You don't need to pay for me. All I did was speak the truth. There is none like Ali ibn al Hussein walking on the face of this earth. And one of the famous Iranian scholars says, In my dream, I saw Farazdaq. And I asked him, How is your position now? And he replied, Because of my lines of poetry for Zain al Abidin, Allah has honored me where I am today. Therefore, you found that Imam Zain al Abidin, every angle of his life was an example for us. And without a doubt, he would never forget what happened on the 10th of Muharram. Imagine how hard for 35 years after Karbala, you would always remember what happened to your father. If he saw a sheep being slaughtered, he would say to the butcher, Oh butcher, when you slaughter a sheep, do you give it water? He said, Yes, O oh Zain al Abideen. Every creation of Allah deserves water before it dies. And he would look at him and say, they killed my father without giving him any water. On another occasion, he saw a man. He saw a man on another occasion who used to dig the graves. He said to him, oh man, when I die, will you bury me? The man said, of course, I will never leave you alone. He said, my father was alone with no one to bury him. On the third occasion, he saw a man calling out, I am Gharib, I am a stranger, help me. Imam came to him and said to him, do you have food? He said, yes, I do. He said to him, do you have clothes? He said, yes, I do. He said to him, oh man, if you were to die, would your family bury you? He said, yes. He said, then don't call yourself a Gharib. A Gharib is one who lay on the ground in Karbala with no one to bury him for three nights alone. But do you know what was the most saddest part? Imam Al-Baqir. When he says, when I was burying my father, when I was in my father's final moments, my father was lying on the bed. The poison of Walid had surrounded his body. It was 35 years after Karbala. He said, I came to my father. The poison was surrounding his body. I came to him and as a son should do to a father, I embraced my father along his chest. My father began to cry in a way I had never seen him cry. I said to him, my father Zain al Abidin, why do you cry? In a moment you will see Rasulullah. In a moment you will see Fatima al Zahra. In a moment you will see Ali ibn Abi Talib. In a moment you will see Al Hassan. In a moment you will see Al Hussein. My father, why do you cry? Listen to the reply. He said to him, oh my son Al Baqir, I cry because when I am dying you are on my chest whereas when my father was dying do you know who sat on the chest of my father when he lay on the ground those lines remained with him until the day he passed away and that's why Abu Hamza Tamali would say to him oh Imam Zayabdi why did you cry Karbala was so many years back he replied oh Abu Hamza Nabi Yaqub cried so much for Nabi Yusuf, even though Yusuf was alive, I saw 17, 18 members of my family killed in front of me. Do you expect me not to cry for them? We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, to allow us to be amongst his companions and those who follow his message. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who are ill in the world in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala. With the following dua, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha on this night of Friday, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Oh.